you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming to your Internet Great Podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. What do we do now? Oh, it's the same old. The drill. Go to YouTube.com for us. Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button. How could we ever forget that? We didn't. We're just testing you. See if you really knew. Uh, go to all the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, especially LinkedIn. Like the LinkedIn newsletter is crazy these days. Go subscribe to that thing. Also go over to our big LinkedIn group, uh, 132,000 people on LinkedIn. Uh, just search for the Chris Voss show anywhere. Also go to goodreads.com for says Chris Voss. You can find my books and uh, all the different uh, books that we're reading and reviewing and the great authors we have on the show. Just amazing stuff lately. We had Nixon's secretary on recently. That was amazing. His personal assistant, I think I should say. Anyway, guys, we have a, another amazing gentleman on the show. He's joining us today to talk about his uh, business and who he is and what he is. And it, Michael, how do we pronounce your last name correctly? Is it Michael? Jake with. It's a tough one, but I appreciate that you asked. Thank that you was so going to be the guess that I was going to take and make. Michael Jake with is on the show with us today. He is going to be uh, talking to us about what he does. He is a life coach uh, with a rather unique background. He has a PhD in chemistry from Cornell and worked in corporate research for almost 10 years. Well, there he was blessed with tremendous mentors and exposure to many good books, and he eventually decided to leave the corporate world to go entrepreneurial. Both his wife and himself have chosen to become certified life coaches. Welcome to the show, Michael. How are you? I'm doing awesome, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming. We certainly appreciate it. Give us your dot coms, places where people can find you on the interwebs. Absolutely. Mine's pretty simple. I am www.catholiclifecoachformen.com. Podcast the same, Catholic Life Coach for Men. My wife took a little different tack. She is www.madeforgreatness.co. No M. Couldn't afford the M, so we're just going with the gut CO. Same deal with the podcast, Made for Greatness. There you go. So uh, tell us more about you. What, what, what sort of is your origin story? Where did you come from and how did you get here, I guess? Absolutely. I grew up in this really kind of broken home up in nor rural northern Michigan. My dad made some epically bad life choices, went to jail for 10 years when I was oh. in sixth grade. There was some, definitely some abuse that occurred before that. And I came out of this home saying, you know what? I'm not going to be that guy. I want to be someone else. Well, turns out that didn't work out quite so well for me. And even though I did like, kind of go out there and work my way through school and end up with this PhD from Cornell. So like, yep, I did it. Put the checks in the box. I get married. I start having kids. And whoa, wait a second. That guy that I was so mad at most of my life, there's a little piece of him that lives in me. And so I was so blessed at this point in time. Like a lot of people, we, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And my apple landed a little closer than I would have liked. Mm. And I had a couple guys at church, a couple guys that are secular. I had this awesome boss when I worked for Intel. Mm -hmm. There's one brief story about that just to kind of highlight him. I was promoted quickly. I was very successful. And first year of having this brand new team, four or five direct reports, he calls me in for a meeting. He says, Michael, we got to talk. I said, sure, what's up? And he's like, okay, this is going to hit you hard, but every single one of your team has asked to leave because they can't stand working for you. Every Ooh. one of them. And I was like, whoa, I, I didn't know what to say. And he said, but I see potential in you. And if you're willing to learn and to change, I'll give you another team. And he took me through the coals, like every email, every meeting he sat in the back and audited, every interaction. And he just, it was a phenomenal. I owe this man a debt I can never repay. Mm -hmm. Because he transformed me so much two years later. I had one of those original five guys in a meeting. And he afterwards physically pulls me to the side at the end of the meeting and says, Michael, what happened? What? Who is this guy I'm talking to now? Because he wasn't here two years ago. And that kind of <laughs> set the stage. Like, I, because of this, I had this taste of how awesome it is to be involved in changing people's lives. That is freaking awesome, man. That is awesome. I'm glad somebody had the insight because you know, uh, sometimes they just usually fire you and they just go, eh, eh, working out and bye. Yeah, yeah. But so, clearly someone saw the potential in you and uh, great leaders do that. And it's really cool. So but where did you uh, segue from there? Because, I mean, you went from being a PhD and a chemist to being a life coach. That's not a, the track most people take. 
No, it's an unusual one. And it's kind of funny. Every so often it comes up when I'm talking to a client and we'll dive into some technical detail and be like, wait a second here. How do you even know this stuff? And it's so it's fun. But so I, I put in <laughs> about seven years at Intel and the entire time working for this guy. And I was given another team. That team did phenomenally well. He was very successful and each year got better. And when I left Intel, we actually wanted to move somewhere else smaller. And then I actually had the flip side experience. I went from the world's best boss to the world's worst boss. This is the world's worst boss who was entirely self-focused, couldn't see any of the big picture. And I just started adopting other people on the team and mentoring them mm -hmm. while I'm working at this other job. Wow. And I love that part so much. And eventually I said, wait a second here. I am feeling like the best part of my day is when I take somebody who's struggling and help them out. And the worst part of my day is when I actually do my job. And so it was rough. It was rough to you know, look at the, all the corporate benefits, so the, the guaranteed paycheck, the retirement, the healthcare, I mean, all that, right? <laughs> and you're like, I don't need those. I can go without those. Ugh. At this point, I've got six kids. And so oh. it's kind of a little scary of a jump in that way as well. Uh -huh. but my wife and I talked about it and we both have this faith background and through a lot of prayer and discernment, we said, all right, we're taking the jump. Wow. And I can tell you twice, I've, I want, I've never looked back. Working for yourself is really one of the greatest things ever. It really teaches you a lot about yourself and makes you, what's the word I'm looking for? Self-actualized, like nothing else. It, yeah. it puts you through the gauntlet like like something else. There's the, Having to, not knowing where your next paycheck is coming from is a whole different high wire. And you know, I started my first company when I was 18 never look back. It's just, it's an extraordinary thing and it teaches you so much. And if you don't learn, you're probably going to business, but how long have you been a life coach now? So I've been two years. We staged mm -hmm. a little bit. My wife launched her business first while I was still working elsewhere. And so that mm -hmm. kind of helped us buffer a little bit. She's been doing this now for about five years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's smart to stagger it. I just, I just, I didn't get a wife. I should have done that. I just can't afford them. I can't afford the divorces. So uh, that's a wife joke. Uh, that's a marriage joke, actually, not a wife joke. But uh, I can't afford the divorce. I'm still saving up for my first divorce to, before I get married. Anyway, well, you know, what right. I tell people life coaching is a whole lot cheaper than divorces. So, you know, you may as well take, oh, take a stab right, at it first. There you go. Might as well. well, I think, I don't know. There's another joke there with stabbing, but I don't know. I'm going to leave it alone. Anyway, enough comedy. So basically, tell us who you usually work with. Who's your clients that people that, that usually can help the most. Absolutely. And they all kind of fall into the same general bracket of category. It, for me, it's a guy. For my wife, it's the ladies. And it's a guy for me who says, oh, I cannot stand that I'm still doing this thing. Maybe he's addicted to pornography. Maybe he's drinking too much alcohol. Maybe he's just being a kind of deep down in his heart. He thinks not a very good husband. And he doesn't like that his wife doesn't like him. Maybe he doesn't like how his kids don't want to be around him. Whatever oh. it is, there's something in his life. And he says, I don't want this anymore and I want to change. Mm. And people love this phrase, oh, he hit rock bottom. I tell people there's no such thing as rock bottom. You just decide one day you've had enough, you're ready to change. And so they come to me, they generally have a faith background, but I work with people who don't as well. And mm. we say, let's change this part of your life. And we look inside and we find something in there that is not what they expected, generally somehow tied to their past and they mm. confront it and good things start happening. That's pretty freaking awesome, man. That's pretty freaking awesome. What are some uh, success stories that uh, you, you're, you're some of your favorites? You know, some of my favorites, I'll give you a couple of quick ones here. I have one client who's completely blind, who came to me just utterly despondent, unable to find a job, couldn't put two bits together, was wife was pregnant and just was really crushed, right? Mm -hmm. And we worked for together for about a year and a half, all things said and done. And at the end of it, he's got a job he loves. He's becoming a father he's proud of being. And he just, he, I mean, he's still just as blind. But the difference now in terms of how he shows up to the world is staggering. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. I know another guy who was in his early 30s, and he came from another troubling household, kind of like my situation. And he just was crushed under this weight of, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I can never succeed. In his head, he wanted to get married, have kids. He wanted a big career. But every time it came up to the moment to say, yes, let's take this risk. Let's try this thing. He backed off because he wasn't good enough. And he never imagined that the core of that came from what his father had told him and how he internalized that. And as we exposed that to the light and brought in that faith background, again, is so powerful. It just, he left on fire. He's like, that's it. I'm going out. Last time I talked to him, he was in a serious relationship. No, no, you know, invitation to marriage yet, but he's working that way pretty intensely. 
Wow. It's interesting so much. We've had a lot of authors on the show and over the years, it's just become really apparent to not only my life, but a lot of people I've known's life. And of course, the study and research that, that people who come on the show talk about how much that childhood experience shapes us and really so kind of almost, I don't know, haunts the right word, but haunt can be the right word sometimes, but it really impacts our whole lives. And it's like a lot of times we really have to go back and reconcile that stuff. It's really, it's like if you were building a house and you said to me, Michael, let's build a house. I said, cool, let's build this foundation and leave some big holes in the foundation. That <laughs> should be fine, right? Let's build fine. the house up there. Sure. Like it's, the first windstorm comes along and you're like, this house is a little shaky. I'm not sure what's going on here, right? And adding a few more two by fours up on the roof isn't going to solve the problem. Sure. I love that analogy. That's like a perfect analogy. Let's build a house on this rickety ass system and see how it turns out. What could go wrong? Really? Right. Think about it. Yeah. It's, I mean, being a parent's tough. I mean, a lot of people don't prepare for it. I, I feel like you should have to go to college for two years to learn how to be a parent and hold a relationship it might help. down. Yeah. Because people always try and do it on the back end to save everything. It's like, well, let's go to counseling when everything goes to hell. Right. <laughs> and you're like, I mean, and I'm not making fun of people to do that. I think that's, I think that's the appropriate thing to do. I've been in that situation where you're at the end of a relationship and you're like, maybe we should go to counseling and fix this broken rickety ass, like you mentioned, uh, holes in the foundation <laughs> system. And uh, I think if I ever got into a long-term relationship again, I would probably just go to counseling like right away so that you could lay a good foundation and stuff. And so it's a, and, and parenting is a tough job. I mean, I, it's, a, it's, that's the reason I didn't have kids. It's tough. It's freaking tough. It's hard as hell. Really you is. don't sleep. I mean, so even if you are sane and you got your shit put together, <laughs> you're not gonna, you're not gonna, long. yeah, you <laughs> Yeah, I, I lose enough sleep. People die. I mean, I, I, I'm on parole for about like 10 murders right now. I'm just kidding. If, <laughs> I'm a bear in the morning. Like I just, I, it takes a couple cups of coffee, about five pounds of B vitamins and uh, to get me up. So what, what are some techniques or, or tips that you can give people to help? And of course, let's plug your podcast as well. You've got a burgeoning podcast. that uh, looks like it's growing quite well. Absolutely. I think the number one thing that I have to say to answer that question as a life coach, and you'll find the first several episodes are all dedicated to this thought, is just understanding the power that your mind has on creating the reality around you. And I don't mean this in some sort of new age woo way. Like I'm coming to you here as a PhD scientist, as a man who's deeply faithful in my background. And I'm telling you all of that aligns with the same conclusion that your thoughts create what happens? Here's a great study I just read. I can't believe this study. ACL surgery, right? You get this control group. One half the control group gets the actual ACL surgery. One half the control group, they just open the knee and don't fix it. The two groups recover at the same rate, which is mind-blowing to me. I had my ACL done about 10 years ago now. Like my little tendon was shattered into little fragments. And the thought that our minds are so strong that they actually can create the reality even for a shattered ligament in the knee is just really cool. And so the first toolbox, the first tool that kit you have to have is to understand you can have a thought and it may even be true, but if it isn't serving you, if it isn't helping you become who you want to be, get rid of it. Yeah. I was coaching once with this gal and she was a lovely lady and she struggled with eat, emotional eating. All right. And so there's this one time her husband's traveling and she bakes a whole tray of brownies and she sits down, puts on her favorite TV show and proceeds to, you got to eat the whole tray in one sitting. Right. And she, she gets like, it's a bad she, thing. Well, exactly, right? And so that's kind of what I was after too there, right? And so she thinks to herself, oh, this is so horrible. I'm the worst person in the world. No one should ever eat a whole tray of brownies in one city. She feels so bad. She gets to make herself some popcorn. That thought's not uh, serving her. It's not yeah, helping her. It definitely is not. <laughs> and so much of it's that one's a silly one we can laugh at. But sure. so much of our life I've never is done that. filled. <laughs> me neither. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure. But it's, it's filled with those sort of thoughts. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting. And it probably goes back to something in their childhood they're trying to reconcile. <laughs> oh, totally. It's, it's it's really interesting. So what made you want to start, uh, you know, what? actually, here's the other question I had in my head. So a lot of, how did a lot of what, becoming a PhD person, because there's a lot of thought process, that's a lot of work to become a PhD. Uh, what, what sort of things and talents of building your career in chemistry and learning your PhD and stuff, how did that really prepare you for being a good life coach? Because I imagine there's a lot of you know, maybe analytical stuff that had to go into when you're dealing with people. How did that convert 
is the word I'm looking for. In, it's actually an incredibly powerful tool in my toolbox. Let me give you a quick story. When I was in doing my graduate work, I came to my boss one day, my mentor, and I said, okay, I've solved the problem. Here's my solution. He looks at it for a few seconds, scratches his head and says, huh, are you so sure about this? I'm like, oh, absolutely. He says, <laughs> let's dig a little deeper. How about we try this experiment and see if it actually is for sure real? And I did it. And of course, he was right. And I, my, my assumption was totally unfounded and too aggressive. Mm -hmm. And so I take that same concept into life coaching. You work with a person, a human being is like one of the most complicated objects we know of in the universe. I mean, just look at their brain alone and the neural interactions there, and that blows away the complexity of galaxies. Mm -hmm. And to make an assumption early on in the process, when I'm discussing a client is a horrible disservice. And I see this happen on so many therapists, so many coaches. Oh yeah. I talked to a guy once who had this problem. I know what's going on. Let's just solve it right now. And that mm -hmm. curiosity, that inquisitiveness, that attention to detail has been a great asset that's really been helpful for me as I do this. I had that problem with salespeople. I used to force my salespeople to ask the first question, what are you trying to accomplish? And then shut up and listen. Yep. And so many of them would take off on a tangent or they were trying to fulfill their monthly quota and they would not be giving the client what they needed or what they wanted. And they would just go right to, uh, closing what they thought they would do or assuming what the client thought they wanted. And sometimes, I mean, there was very rare times, usually with the, it was with a new loan officer who, was, who wasn't following the rules of what you're trying to accomplish and listen. And sometimes we have somebody at closing, they're like, I want a 15-year mortgage instead of a 30-year mortgage. People were just on autopilot. And, and sometimes people that are leaders or instructors, they can do that. They can be on autopilot and they just go, or, or they just go for low-hanging fruit that's easy to solve. So I think it's good that you have that sort of analytical background because a lot of good coaches that I've seen, they do have a really good analysis. They can, they'll sit and listen and they really know what the real target is instead of just low hanging fruit. And it's hard work. Like it's really, you have to really take your own brain, set aside everything that's going through my head. What did my wife make for dinner last night? Which of the kids just, you know, took, we just got baby chicks and it's that time of year. And so they're carrying their chicks around the chicks poop everywhere. It's like all that stuff has to be taken, put to the side, make a hundred percent focused on uncovering the details of what's going on in front of you. That's uh, you guys have chickens in the house. Yeah, so we live in northern Idaho, and uh -huh. we have five acres, and this has been a very cold spring, and so we just got uh -huh. our babies this year, and it's too cold for them to be outside, so we took oh, our downstairs yeah. space, created a little chicken area down there. Oh, the kids are, that's the best babysitter of all time. The really? kids haven't come up since. Wow! All right, if I have kids, note to self, get chickens. Yeah, it's been during cold. I'm so, it's supposed to warm up though this week. Like, it's a guest you have in your podcast. Tell us about that. So I love having guests that have either encountered some sort of darkness in their life that they've overcome hmm. or have encountered some sort of way that they've really transformed a part of their life to be better. And those are almost the same thing. We the, People sometimes say, oh, I don't have that much darkness. And I say, really? Because <laughs> the darkness is relative. And and just to throw it out there, like the, one of the first things that always happens whenever we talk about childhood is people tell me, don't worry, my parents were good parents. I'm like, well, sure. They tried hard. I, I mean, my wife and I joke all the time. We think it's more important to start a therapy fund for our kids than a college fund. They're going to need it more, right? Like, I, I'm, I screw up too, like everybody else. And so it's okay to say, yeah, my, my kids are going to need some help and you need some help. And the same because your parents, they weren't perfect. Yeah. And in embracing that, allowing that to be said out loud, oh, my parents did this thing and I took it this way. And here's what it did to me initially. And here's how I changed how I look at it. That's the core right there. Almost everybody has a story that fits something like that. A therapy fund. <laughs> I'm telling you, that I, I think that. it's the way of the future. You don't need a college fund. You need a therapy fund. I love it. I, that's brilliant. I mean, people should be doing that. I, it's one of those things. What are some great stories you've had on the podcast? Oh, let's me think here. So here's a great story. And we're going to pull a little bit of the faith element for this story. So here's this guy. And he's married. He has four children. He's making almost no money. And they're renting this house. And he and his wife both feel that God called him. Oh, you should buy this house over here, which, by the way, was totally outside their budget. There's like no possible way that you could even do it. And he's like, this is ridiculous. It's his wife says, tells him this. Like, I, mean, I think she's just dreaming. But nevertheless, he sits down and he really evaluates what's going on inside of himself and says, maybe this is the way to do it. And so he takes the leap with a little bit of introspection, actually a lot in his case. He would claim a lot of introspection, a lot of hard work inside. He said, okay, we're going to take the work. 
And it's so funny. There's probably, he said, 15 or 20 different points along the way where it looked like God was going to pull the rug out from under them. They weren't going to get the house. And the last minute, some crazy stuff all aligned. Things were discovered on the property that mean, meant they had to drop the price significantly. Oh, and wow. they pushed it just barely into the range. At the last minute, he found a banker that approved him for this little bit more. At the last minute, his parents chipped in a little bit of money unexpectedly. And like, this whole series of events that all came around because he was willing to face his own insecurities and his own doubts and say, yeah, I'm going to push forward and try for this thing. That's pretty freaking amazing. It's sometimes we know in the back of our minds what we should do, and we just have to figure out a way to do it. But it's amazing the problem solving that, that the human beings are available to. What is there a hard case that you've ever had to solve that you were able to overcome for to help someone in their coaching? Yeah, I, I think some of the hardest cases to solve deal with identities. And when we see ourselves as being a certain sort of person. Let's say I am a bad father. I am an alcoholic. I am mm. whatever. These identities become internalized so deep that we cease to even be aware that they're there. And as a coach, when I go into tug on one of these identity pieces, it feels like I'm shaking their world. Yeah. I've had grown men, like imagine big burly men who could like point the way to the gym with one arm, break down sobbing because they realize that they've internalized this piece of their identity. I'm thinking particularly of this one man right now, and he was really struggling with addiction to pornography. Mm. And he had internalized the identity that he was a bad man. And I think he was not actually understanding the faith-based background in his proper setting. That's something we talked about. But because of how he looked at it, because of what happened to him as a kid and what his mother was, and all these different pieces, his identity was that he was corrupt, he was broken, there was nothing that could be done for him. Mm. And like right now, one of the things I tell clients all the time we look at the word broken in modern parlance what do you do with something it's broken you throw it away i've got this little pen right here if it broke right now my trash can's there i toss it hmm. but then when we think about how, if i am a human being and broken well boy that's a very scary conclusion all of a sudden and to challenge that piece of identity to even go there and look at it is really difficult so as a coach you have to create a space that's safe enough to even be able to go and look at it to challenge it, and eventually to take it out and say no there is goodness in you, no matter what you have done. And praise be the Lord, he was clean and sober from, so he's been over a year and a half now. He's been completely sober from pornography. And that was, wow. that's what he wanted. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So you work with the men in the business and then your wife works with the women. That's probably a good way to separate the workload and, and identify stuff that you need to take and do. There's several different resources you have on your website. You've got a marriage and family. Let me pull that back. I opened your master's section there. You've got marriage and family, leadership, and faith that you have some resources set up. So tell them about some of that. I, I think it's really important to understand <clears throat> that when you want to change your life, you first have to very clearly identify what is the problem. It's so common. People at the start will be like, I'm just grumpy. I'm unhappy. I'm unsatisfied. I'm unfulfilled. I mean, we could make a Rolodex of all those complaints. Mine is I haven't had my coffee. Well, there you go. But see, you've, you've identified the problem. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a blood caffeine level problem. Here. There's a change here, right? So at least you're ahead of the game there. Yeah. But when... Well, lots of times what I'm trying to do is if I get somebody who's in this malaise of unspecified grumpiness, I want to, at least from the right from the beginning, start them thinking. And it's that critical thinking that's so key. What is the problem statement? Where is it at? Is it in how I'm leading people? Is it at my job? Is it my wife? Or a lot of us, we don't know because it spills out everywhere. And this was my story I mentioned earlier. I saw it spilling out at home. I saw it spilling at my job. I mean, my, they all, my whole team wants to leave. My wife's super grumpy. It, what is it? But to understand that on a deeper level starts right there. And so I think leadership, I'm a John Maxwell fan to the core. I think leadership is influence and that we're called to do that in every aspect of our life. And that's a really powerful and fulfilling calling. Whether you want to focus in more on your marriage and your family, which a lot of guys do. It's a very common phenomenon right now that most of the guys I work with, whatever reason they come in with, we end up drifting into marriage, family, and sexuality. Like that's just a part that every guy struggles with right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's... It is good to have those differentiations, but that struggle, that digging, I think is what's really most important. There you go. So on your website, you have a section for masters. Tell us about what that is and, and what you do there. So this is new and I need to fully own. I'm copycatting my wife on this one. Don't tell her I said that. And they launched this group program as they filled up with one-on-one -on -one clients. Here's how it goes. You get to the point where you just can't take any more clients to work one-on-one -on -one, and so you introduce a group setting. And so I'm totally copycatting her and stealing her idea, which she stole from someone else, though, which is this idea <laughs> of 
if you're a guy who is maybe you're not quite in the depths of despair and you're able to process and live on your own, you join this. It's a pretty it's a pretty nominal monthly fee. There's videos, there's a community, there's group coaching. Group coaching is awesome because the biggest problem I think that drags people down is this belief that they're alone. Nobody else struggles with this. I go to Facebook. My friends have an idyllic life on Facebook. I go to all the other social media and everything is perfect. But you go to this group coaching call and you hear each person talking about how they're f- viewing themselves as a failure at work and their marriage and as a father or whatever. And you're like, I thought it was only me. And so that group setting can be very powerful. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, it makes all the difference in the world with the being able to have people that sometimes we get trapped in feeling alone. Like it's just me and the world hates me and I just suck. And you think your problems are the only, you're the only one who has them in the world. <laughs> you're like, absolutely. Uh, I'm the only one who has these problems. And then uh, the beautiful part about stories and, and group settings and learning from each other. And this is why we have stories. And really when it comes down to movies, books, everything is stories and parables that we can use to learn from each other's mistakes or, or see how others solve problems. Just like you borrowed your wife's thing. Don't tell her. So that's how we, that's how we learn as human beings. Cause the life doesn't come with an instruction manual. Last time I checked is, is uh, has anybody else gotten one? I haven't got one. Yeah. So I, it's in the mail from what I understand. They're still having issues over there. So this is how we learn. We learn from stories and lessons. And one of the beautiful parts is sometimes when you feel mo- the most alienated from everyone in life is when you talk to other people, you find that Hey, wow. Okay. You had some challenges and experiences like I did, like I'm having right now. How did you solve them? Or you got through this and they can tell you, Hey man, I went through, you know, I went through this with my dogs passing away, the grief part and dealing with death and loss of it for me, a dog child. And I started talking to other people and sharing my pain and they're like, Hey man, I got through it. You're going to be fine. You just got to, it takes time. Just take it day by day. And the people that can help guide you through the darkness and challenges of life. So the group settings are really good that way. I mean, it's really, it's really bad when we become isolated and we don't realize that there's other people that can maybe help us get through our issues. I think empathy is so important. This is mm-hmm. something I took from your own your books. I I regularly give my clients homework to read books from different people, including your books. And I think when I the story I'm thinking of particularly is, is comes from Never Split the Difference with the, the, the where you're trying to connect with the people through a hotel door. That's and the other empathy, Chris Voss. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. But the empathy part is so powerful and you need to set the stage for that. It's very hard to have empathy Mm -hmm. when we think somebody's in a totally different situation and isn't struggling with what we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, I I think I talk about in my book, Beacons of Leadership, and whether it's empathy, it's about more about leadership in the context of that, but empathy and understanding other people and stuff. And of course, I think it's in characters and stuff. So what are the things that we need to touch on about you and and who you are and what you do? I think the only last point I want to throw out there is a lot of people have this notion that modern life coaching is somehow woo or new age or mystic-y. And, and don't get me wrong, there certainly are coaches out there who embrace that approach. What I want to tell them is that's not necessarily true. Life coaching is an entirely compatible. My own Christian faith background is 100% compatible with the truths and approaches that are embraced by life coaching. My science, if you want to be whatever you are, Don't allow a difference in perception about what something might mean to stop you from pursuing and getting help because it is an option. It can be better. We we think we're stuck. We think we're trapped. We think we're alone and we think we're broken. And, oh, don't worry. I can't try that because here's my Rolodex of excuses, right? (laughs) Take that Rolodex, throw it away and be like, hey. Maybe there is a chance something to hear my work. Check it out. Both my wife and I, we offer a free one-hour phone call. doesn't cost you a dime. Come find out what's going to happen. Most of the time when people come, they start the phone call like this. And they say, Michael, this is probably bogus. There's nothing here that's going to happen. And we end the phone call like this. Tears coming down the eyes saying, I can't believe this part was in me and I didn't even know it. Wow. And it can be transformational. There you go. Yeah. So how do people book with you? So you can go to my website, www.catholiclifecoachformen.com. Same thing for my wife at www.madeforgreatness.co. She spent all her money on the group coaching, so she can't afford the M. And 
just right there, you'll find a link for coaching for, we call it a discovery call to discover if it's right for you. And it's totally possible that you can find an awesome coach that doesn't fit you. And that's totally fine. It's the same thing with therapists. I talk to people all the time who say, I had this horrific event in my childhood and now I'm trying to find a therapist, but everyone I talk to is horrible. I'm like, cool. Keep looking. <laughs> you will find one that does. Take a risk, even if there are other differences. My wife and I found a marriage coach who was like as far from us religiously as they could get, but she was brilliant and she made real big help. I'm speaking well now, aren't I? But she makes some really big impacts to how we communicate as a married couple. Mm -hmm. And so you find the person that can help you and don't stop looking until you do. That's definitely important. I mean, communication is so important. Like I said, I, I, people should really go to college as kids and you should have to go to college for two years and figure out how to communicate with each other. Be, be good spouses to each other. I think that would really help a lot of marriages. I'm still, oh, going, sure. I'm still going to college to learn how to be a better person so I can be a good spouse someday. Uh, I think at about 70, I should have myself mastered, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go well it's been wonderful to have you on the show uh, michael we've certainly learned a lot give us your plugs again the podcast and everything else so people can find you on the interwebs <clears throat> absolutely you'll find me at www.catholiclifecoachformen.com podcast catholic life coach for men you'll find my wife at www.madeforgreatness.co no m same thing with the podcast made for greatness that comes from i think it was pope benedict who said you were not made for comfort you were made for greatness which is really an awesome way to look at the coaching in general which is if you're willing to go through the discomfort greatness is what waits on the other side there you go there you go. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, Michael. Thanks, Minus, for tuning in. Uh, be sure to go to youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification button. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. See all the wonderful things we're reading and reviewing. Also, go to <clears throat> excuse me, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those great places where the show is featured and all that good stuff. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.